So today I will talk about the connection beam pseudo remnants and, and property testing and how, how we can use both to basically establish limits on both and basically learn basically what are the limits on pseudo remnants and, and, and property testing. Okay. Doesn't work. Okay, there we go. So why do we care about randomness? Well, pseudonymous is essentially about randomness, and randomness is important for many things, such as cryptography, for communication, benchmarking. And in the classical, you talk about care about Monte Carlo simulation. There, you always basically randomness or even quantum randomness. Now, how do we actually generate randomness? Well, in the classic case, it's relatively easy. You just basically randomly select a bit 0, 1 by some kind of random process. Now, in the classical world, it's a bit more complicated. Of course, like the, the quantum true randomness would be, let's say, a Haranum state or a Haranum unitary. So to visualize this, basically, you would kind of draw uniformly from the Ha measure, is uniformly from the space of, of states or, or, or unitaries. For example, if it's a qubit, it would be kind of drawn uniformly from the block sphere. But as, if you scale up, let's say you, go, you want to draw a uniform state from a high uh, many Q n qubit state, you'll find out this gets very complicated. In fact, it scales exponentially. So if you want to sample an n qubit state, the resource you need is exponentially a number of qubits n. So basically the bigger you are, the more difficult it gets. And it's technically or practically impossible to generate hard randomness, <laughs> let's say on a quantum computer, it's not efficient. So if you want to generate quantum randomness, this is something we cannot do in any practical sense. So to solve this, we can harness concept from, from what people call uh, harness concept from, from classical the idea, maybe the idea of kind of having this to generate randomness in a computational way point of way. So we have suddenly, this is, was introduced very nicely by Tom Yuki on Monday. We have, for example, in the classical world, we have something called absolute random generator, which is kind of a, 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 an object that generates pseudo random bits by using a small random key k, which is much smaller than the number of bits that you want to generate. And you use a deterministic algorithm that produces the, the random looking bits. Now this algorithm is deterministic obviously, but uh, by implying a random key, the output will look very random. And for example, you know this in a very practical sense. Let's say if you if you program in Python, you use this many times. So you use, for example, you call numpy.random, and then you can print out random integers or random bits or random floats, whatever you like. And it just spits out many random looking numbers. And the randomness of these numbers is guaranteed, uh, assuming some kind of computational assumption. So we need some kind of underlying assumptions and the most fundamental assumption in classic crypto is the existence of one-way functions. If one-way function exists, then we know that these random numbers will look random to any efficient algorithm. So any efficient algorithm will think these, run these numbers look just like true randomness, although they're actually generated by some kind of algorithm. Okay, so this is a way of generating classical randomness. And now you can transfer this concept into a quantum world by the concept of quantum pseudo states. You heard about this on Monday. So the idea is we have now an, an ensemble of now quantum states, we now go into the quantum world, and they're parameterized by some kind of key K. And we demand two conditions on this set of, of this ensemble of states. First, it must should be efficiently preparable by a quantum polynomial, polynomial tile algorithm. And if you take a polynomial number of copies of these states and you run some kind of efficient quantum polynomial tile algorithm on it, it will look it will be any, it will be indistinguishable from Harvard states. So if I give some kind of algorithm or any quantum computer, uh, many copies of these of these pseudo states, it will say they look just like Harvard state. It can't tell them apart, but then it looks the same. So they kind of mimic Harvard randomness, but um, for any efficient algorithm, but now we can prepare them in an efficient manner, right? Because Harvard randomness, as I said before, takes exponential time. Now we can do this efficiently. Again, of course, we need some kind of price to pay. And the price to pay is you have some kind of underlying computation assumption we need. But it turns out they're actually weaker than classical pseudo randomness. So we can actually, well, it has been shown by question that it's potentially possible to generate pseudo random states uh, using assumption that they're weaker than, than one-way function, but you can use even some, some weaker concepts and still get PS. So that means even if maybe uh, classical pseudo randomness doesn't exist, quantum pseudo randomness may still exist. So they, you can basically appraise on weaker assumptions. Now, how do we actually, let's say you go back to practice, how do we actually make a PS, a pseudonym state? Well, people proposed many different constructions, first one back in 2018. Um, for as a kind of demonstration, let's look like at this one. This is called the binary phase state. So the binary phase state is like a, you take a computation basis state x, and then you sum over x, 
And for each combinatorial basis state, you now assign a phase plus or minus one. And the phase plus or minus one, you assign by a pseudorandom function. So this function will either spit on a plus five, will either assign a phase plus one or minus one, um, by basically choosing this function, which is parameterized by key k, and basically randomly assign a, basically not randomly, but according to this function, it will assign a phase plus or minus one. And one can show that this binary phase state is a PS, so it's indistinguishable for any a quantum algorithm, efficient quantum algorithm from Haranum states. Although it actually looks nothing like a Haranum state, right? It doesn't really look like like drawn randomly, randomly for the Haranum space, yet you can show that this is actually indistinguishable for Haranum states for any efficient algorithm. Okay, and the nice features is, first of all, one can show that these states can be prepared in polylog def. So the circuit def is only polylog. So this is quite amazing because Haranum, as I said before, takes exponential def. Now we basically get a uh, doubly exponential advantage in, in circuit depth to prepare them. So we can generate what looks hard random in our extremely short depth. And secondly, it's also interesting to note this will come upon later, if this thing is real valued, right? There's no complex phases here. It's just plus and minus signs, it's extremely simple. In, in particular, there's no complex numbers. Like quantum mechanics numbers has complex numbers. Here, there's none. Okay, you can also play the game again and go to and, and define similarly pseudo and unitaries. You heard of this before. It can be efficiently implemented and they're indistinguishable from Haran and unitaries for any efficient algorithm. Now, again, we can ask, how do we actually make one? Now, it turns out this question is a bit more complicated. In fact, it took six years to solve it. It was only solved recently in January by Shu Stanko. And why it's complicated, I will now elucidate. Let's take the most naive idea how to make a PRU. Let's say we, because we know how to make PS, right? So let's just take the state preparation routine of PS and make it into PU. And can we, would that be a PRU? Let's say, for example, if you take our binary phase state, right, with this plus and minus signs, and basically it can be prepared by basically a unitary applied on a product state. And this unitary is like basically just a unitary that randomly, or not according to the function assigns the phases plus or minus one. Now we could ask, is this thing, can this thing be a PRU? I mean, this thing obviously the state prepared by this unitary is a PRU, but is the unitary that prepares a PS a PRU? One can think maybe yes, right? I mean, it, it's able to generate PS. Why not also prepare? Is it also a pseudo unitary? Um, so we now see in a minute whether or not this is actually a PRU. But we can now ask more the question like, what are the fundamental limits, limits needed to, in order to be a PRU? Like, what is the requirements? What is necessary in order to become a PRU? Can we establish somehow some limits on that? And for that, we need another concept which is called um, property testing. So the idea is very simple. Let's say I give you a state psi. And now I want to check, does the state psi have a particular property Q? To give a very concrete example, let's say we want to test the entanglement in the system, like how much non-local correlations are in the system. Now, if the state is pure, we can actually test this. So we can, if you are given experimentally, let's say you have a, someone gives you a state psi, you can actually make a test and say whether the state is separable or whether the state is entangled. And you can do this efficiently. For example, in, in, we can just using something called a swap test, like this. And this test basically tells us, is the state entangled, or is it separable, or is it, not, or is it highly entangled? So we can separate these two cases. And this is what people call a property testing. We can check for the property of entanglement. And basically, you can use this, for example, to distinguish states with low and high resources. And one can do this not only for entanglement, but people propose similar testers for other properties, which are important, other important resources of in, 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 in quantum. For example, people propose such tests for, for magic, which is the degree of not being a Clifford state. And uh, for coherence, which is kind of how much superposition does a state have or unit have, and also imaginarity, which asks me the question, how much complex amplitudes are in the quantum state or the unitary? So these are all important resources that people need for, for to do quantum computing, or quantum communication and so forth. It's, it's one of the, the most important resources for quantum. And using this, we can now establish limits on what properties PS and PRU need. So first of all, um, Haranum states, as I said before, they're very complicated. They need a lot of resources. In particular, you can show they have near maximum entanglement, matching coherence. In fact, it's linear. Whereas now we know that there are efficient property tests that are able to distinguish low and high resource states. In particular, for entanglement magic and coherence, we know efficient algorithms that can check whether a state has less than logarithmic let's say entanglement and linear entanglement. So you can separate these two cases efficiently. And that means basically if we have a state which has less than log entanglement, 
then there is an efficient test to distinguish it from Harvard states, which have a lot of entanglement. So therefore, they cannot be a PAS or a PAU. So in order to be a PSU, a minimum condition is that they need at least polylog entanglement. Because once it's polylog, there's no efficient way, there's no efficient test that can uh, distinguish them. Or there is, we don't, don't know any efficient test to distinguish from uh, entanglement and magic or coherence from Harvard and states. So this basically gives us, a, oh, it's all screwed up here, but yeah, you can still see it. So this gives us a, um, a basically a lower bound on the resources needed in the product to prepare PS and PU. In fact, for entanglement magic and coherence, one can show that you need at least polylog entanglement magic and coherence in order to, to prepare them. This is the minimal requirement due to property testing. And for example, we show that, um, um, that for PS and PU, not having low coherence implies they must not be sparse. And also for PU, there is an efficient test, or for unit test, there's an efficient test to check for, for complex numbers, so whether a state has a complex numbers inside or not. And this directly implies that the unitary we talked about earlier, right, that assigns random plus and minus sizes cannot be a PIU, right, because it's obviously sparse. And also it has no complex numbers, so therefore it must not be PIU. This is quite interesting because this implies also that making PIUs is much harder than making PS. There's more stringing conditions, but this explains again why making PAUs was so more difficult than just making PSs. Also, a fun fact: um, while PAUs cannot be com need complex numbers, this is not the case for for PAS. So, pseudonym states actually can be revalued. Right? We had this binary phase state before that is just completely real, but this is indistinguishable from Harvard and unitaries, uh, Harvard and states. So, this actually now allows us to put a bound on property testing. So using this existence of the state, we can now show that testing for imaginarity of states is inefficient. So you cannot check whether a state has complex or real numbers, like they look the same. So that's quite interesting because testing basically unitaries, you can efficiently test unitaries for complex numbers, but for states, this is not possible. Like you can't check whether a state has complex numbers or real numbers. So some of this resource imaginarity is testable for, not testable for states, but you can efficiently test it for unitaries. So there's a weird gap between the two that we don't find in any other resource. So this is quite curious. OK, now we can ask another limit, namely, when we want to run actually something on a quantum computer, we always have to deal in the end with noise. Now we asked, are PS and PR robust noise? Let's say, can we run a noisy quantum computer? And we showed basically this is not possible, because um, uh, you can easily see that um, if a PS or PU is subject to even very small noise, one or poly n noise, there is an efficient algorithm to distinguish from Harvard and unitaries, which are inherently pure. For example, you can use the swap test. So what this implies is that as, as soon as we have even a little amount of noise, there is no uh, uh, PAU stop being PAUs and PS stop being PS. That means PS and PU are not possible, let's say, in a NISC or early photons, where we expect to have uh, the, uh, a bit amount of noise. In order to actually prepare them in practice and actually prepare them in their full glory, we actually need to go to a limit where we have very good error correction and we basically we can remove all the nice down to an exponential or natural amount of level. So this puts very hard and stringing conditions on, on how to actually prepare them in practice on a quantum computer. Okay, but now we can ask maybe that's too disappointing. Is there a way of somehow generating pseudo in a way that is robust to noise? For this, we introduce something what we call a pseudon density matrix, which is a generalization of the pseudon states to mixed states. So we can immediately generalize this. First of all, we, we, gener we generalize Harvard states. So Harvard states is like drawn uniformly from the space of uh, Harvard uh, from, from quantum states. We can generalize to what we call the generalized Hilbert Schmidt ensemble, which is basically just Harvard states, but you trace out m qubits. So you just check out m qubits, and then you get an ensemble. And we now say that pseudon density matrix or PDMs are, first of all, they're efficiently preparable. So meaning we can, you can show you can easily prepare them, for example, taking a PS to some state and tracing out M qubits. That gives you a uh, efficient way to prepare them. And second, they're indistinguishable from this generalized Hilbert Schmidt ensemble. So you can't tell them apart. And obviously, if you take the case M equals zero, we don't trace any qubits, we come back to PS. And if you trace a polylog amount of qubits, in fact, we can find that PDMs are indistinguishable for any polynomial time algorithm from the maximally mixed state. So they just look like completely trivial states. But the nice thing is that in this regime, PDMs are actually noise robust. Namely, you can show that they are robust to unit noise channels. So even after applying unit noise channels, a PDM is still a PDM. So they basically are, uh, this is a definition that remains robust to noise. 
and in fact, it applies to arbitrary noise, unit noise channels. And we can actually directly apply this in practice. We, for example, show we can use this to construct noise robust deep IPS, which we learned about on Mondays. This is basically a very important cryptography primitive. And we can show that using this PADMs, we can construct um, PADMs, which can tolerate more noise than the threshold of the service code there. So they're extremely robust. So they can extreme, tolerate extremely high levels of noise and still be functional if IPS. So this is something that could be realized directly on today's quantum computers. So this is some, something that's very interesting to actually make first experiments in, in quantum crypto. Okay, so I come back now to this idea of the resources. So how much resource do we need to actually prepare uh, pseudo-states? Um, pseudo As I mentioned before, harm states need a lot of resources, but um, it's like how much entanglement, matching coherence is like linear. But this is actually needed also, let's say, for pseudonym states, or can we go lower? Like, do they need the same amount of resources as Harlem states, or can we push this much lower? In fact, yes. So this was shown by Scott Ernst and Co. They do what they call quantum pseudo entanglement. So these are like um, pseudo um, states. Pseudo entanglement states are states which have a lower amount of entanglement. It's like polylog across every bipartition. So they have like a, yeah, they have extremely low entanglement, relatively low entanglement. But they're indistinguishable for any efficient algorithm from states with linear amount of entanglement. So you have like states which are kind of nearly area law, yet for any efficient algorithm, they look like volume law, highly entangled states. So using something that is extremely low entangled, you can mimic something that has extremely high entanglement. So with low, low resources, you can pretend to be high resources. So this is a very nice kind of way, like pretending to be more than you actually are. And we generalize this concept now, what we call pseudo resources. So the idea is that basically you have two ensembles, which are indistinguishable for any efficient algorithm. And the first ensemble is like a high resource ensemble with let's say f of n resource. And the second is a low resource ensemble. And we now ask like, what's the maximal largest possible gap between those two? So like basically what's the maximum gap between this f of n, the largest resource possible minus the smallest possible resource g of n, and they still remain indistinguishable. And we can basically show that um, we can basically map this out for pure states. And basically, we find that um, um, for, let's say, entanglement matching coherence, you have a gap of uh, linear versus polylog. So, this is for pure states the maximum gap between those two. So, basically, by polylog, let's say you can have states with polylog coherence, yet they look like states with, with linear, linear coherence. So, you can basically use very low resources to mimic high resource states. Interesting that doesn't work for imaginarity because I mentioned earlier, real states are already PS. So basically you can basically mimic high complex numbers by using basically real numbers, which is quite funny. Um, now we can ask, is this actually the best you can do? Right? Because there's still this kind of gap between polylog and linear. Like, or can we do actually better? And in fact, you can by going to this PADMs, these kind of mixed states, we can actually get better pseudo resource gaps. Uh, for pure states, you have this gap as I mentioned before, for polylog versus linear, this is the best you can actually do. You can show this is optimal. But if you now go through these PADMs, these kind of mixed generalization, you can actually get much bigger pseudo resource gaps. So in fact, we show that PADMs can have a gap between linear, the maximum resource, versus zero. So basically you can have states which are like completely trivial, the maximum mixed stage, but they're indistinguishable from resource state with near maximal resource. So basically by Bringing in states with basically zero resource, you can pretend to be high resource state, vice versa. You can have high resource states, which you can mask as trivially maximum state. So you can efficiently kind of hide resources completely from site. So anyone who's checks will say like, these are like, like high, uh, low resource states, but they actually contain a lot of resource. It's a very, very good way of hiding your resources in plain sight. And this has actually very strong implication on property testing. And namely, what this implies is that testing entanglement matching coherence is in general inefficient. So this is quite important. So that means basically, so why is this the case? Because we have these ensembles which are indistinguishable. There must be not any property test for this, right? Because else these PADMs couldn't exist with this pseudo resource gap. So this basically implies that in general, these resources like entanglement matching coherence, although they're like the key properties of quantum computing and quantum information, right? That's what we care about. These are like the key properties that heavily affect the structure of quantum states. Yet there's no way to tell them apart. Like, we cannot say whether state has high or low resources in general. Like there's no experimental way to distinguish those two. So they're not really efficient observers in nature. They're more like, yeah, concepts we in general cannot tell apart. And we showed that this depends heavily on the purity testing efficiency. 
So for pure states, they are efficient tests to test for these resources. But once you go to low purity, we don't know how to test them anymore. And this also has an interesting implication. I'm not going to more details than this, but basically we show all that black box resource distillation, where you basically distill resources without knowing the state, is inherently inefficient. You can't do this in practice. Okay, so if this already right, come to conclusion, so I showed you basically there's some limits of property testing and peer use, and basically you can use PS and PU to states to basically give limits on property testing, and property testing gives you limits on a PS, so they have a very nice interplay. I showed you about the pseudo resources that we can mimic low resource states and high resource states, and you can basically completely hide resources from site completely by using these PADMs, these mixed states. And I showed you that property testing is in general inefficiency. And there's not many future works, just some ideas. Um, you can have uh, asked whether there's other noise robust application of pseudo renders that we could realize maybe in the near term or in early fall terms right now. Or we can also ask what other properties resource besides these resources are actually important for pseudo renders and which are not important. So we're going to try to map out because there's many more resources of this kind, which one more we can map out. And there's many more things. So this is very exciting. And with this, uh, I thank you very much for attention. And yeah, thank you very much. Hi, thanks yeah. a lot for an interesting talk. Um, I just wonder how your results, um, the uh, sparseness and the complexity requirements relaxes if you just want a T design instead of like true harm and uh, randomness. Um, for T design, if you have a two design, so one design doesn't need any coherence, like maximum mixed state is already a one design. For two designs, I think you need at least uh, normally volume law entanglement, volume law coherence, everything. Like anything needs to be linear for, for two designs already. So anything above two designs needs a lot of coherence, magic, and so forth, and entanglement. Okay, and, and also how does your result generalize to general like QDITs, any dimensions? Um, that's a good question. So there was one study on the limits. So um, yeah, it's not clear yet. I mean, I think the, the bounds, how much resource needed to generate may be lower for QDITs. So there's a work by Zhao. I'm not sure if he's in the audience. Yeah, yeah, you can ask him. He's the expert on this. So he studied QDITs, so he knows more. So you should ask him afterwards. Thanks. But yeah, it's an open question. It's not clear yet completely. That's a question. OK, uh, thank you for, for the talk. I am a bit confused about your definition of robustness. Mm -hmm. So when you first mentioned robustness in your talk, so do you apply noise only to your pseudo-random state, or do you apply noise both to pseudo-random and to the Tuchar state? Uh, uh, it's only applied on the pseudo-random state itself. Because if you apply both in Har and the pseudo-random state, then you apply the same noise in both, right? So they will still remain indistinguishable. Okay. So the idea is that you apply it only on the, on the, the, state, on the, on the state. And then you ask, is this still distinguishable from a Harvard state? And obviously it's not, right? Because now you can use the swap test to distinguish it. OK, thank you. Yeah. Other question? So I have also some question. Oh, yeah, so yeah, for sure. pure uh, PRSG, from pure PRSG, you can construct the money and uh, one-way generator mm -hmm. uh, because uh, there is some verification algorithm for pure PRS. So if you have a key, you can verify that this state is psi k. Yes, and yes. for mixed PRS, mm -hmm. can you verify that? Is there any verification? Ah, the verification. Um, that's a good point. Um, yes, so because we define via the tracing out, right? So in order to verify, you actually need the traced out part back in, right? You need the, the traced out qubits to verify. Mm -hmm. Um, but there is an alternative definition of, of PDMs where you could do verification efficiently using the key. But I disagree, like with this definition, you can't, but there's an alternative definition you could use that is verifiable. Yeah. So you don't know how to construct, for example, private key from this mixed PRSG? I said with this definition, you can't, but there's an alternative definition where you could actually do it. That's pretty much equivalent to this one. How, how, how can you verify mixed state? Um, so you can do some kind of randomness injection. Uh, I can tell you that about okay. it if you want. Yeah. Yeah, uh, quick question. Is your um, result for your gap for mm -hmm. uh, entanglement, is it a result or is it a conjecture? Oh, sorry, that's a conjecture, yes, yes. Oh, I was right. unclear, but this is so far a conjecture. 
right. because we didn't manage to actually compute. But uh, I think it's likely true because we can show it for states which are inefficient repair. Uh, we can actually show this exactly this gap. Okay. And what, but what, for for we don't find a we, for the PS we didn't manage the calculation. But okay, yeah, you, you didn't get any. But did you get anything? Or? No, I, because it's quite difficult to compute I segments. See, see. But there are computations for states which are inefficient. For those, you can actually show this gap exists. Right. So the, the efficient part is still lacking. But I think it's it's very likely to be true. Because, right. I mean, there's many indications it should be the case. But I agree, it's a conjecture. Mm. So, right. um, but yeah, if, if someone expert on how to compute this, would be very, very much appreciated how to actually compute this explicitly. It's, yes. it's a bit trickier. But it's a technical problem, I think. Uh, hi, thanks for a nice talk. So I just have a very minor question about the unital noise channel, right? Is it a global noise channel or is it like single qubit or small local qubit channels? Um, the noise channel we use is a single qubit channel, but it doesn't matter. You can pretty much use any noise channel you want. Okay. And you, for any noise channel you find, you find pretty much the same results. It doesn't really matter what kind of noise you choose. We just use this for, for convenience. Because the most common noise model, but you will find the same result for any noise channel. And do we know anything about a non-unital one? Uh, you will find the same issue for non-unital noise because normally non-unital noise will again you can probably find a, some kind of PVM that distinguishes them. Let's say if you use uh, amplitude dampening again, you can find some PVM that will distinguish them officially. Okay, thank you. Is there a question? So here you say that uh, if you have some noise, you cannot yes. construct a PRU. Yes. But on the other hand, some people believe that random circuit is PRU. So do you mean, so for example, mm -hmm. can you say that uh, if you have a random circuit, or if you get some part of this output, mm -hmm. this cannot be PRU or something like that? Because if you have some random circuit, and if you trace out some of them, mm -hmm. maybe effectively you get apply some noise, but according mm. to your result, this shouldn't be PRU. Uh, no, not by not by average, at least. I mean, you could do some kind of post selection. Maybe then it could still be made PRU. Like if you measure some part of the system, then you can generate a random on the left. But this is not an efficient process because it requires post selection. So, yeah, yeah. so as soon as you add some noise, whether by tracing out, uh, I think it's not a PRU. I mean, it will be something else, right? You could define some kind of, uh, okay. let's say, random channels or something that may still work. But I don't think it will be unitary, right? Because this unitary requires perfect pureness. Like you need to be pure up to extremely low noise levels. So maybe you could show that some specific construction of PRU from random circuit is not possible. Um, I mean, random circuit is with noise. And if there's no noise, it's fine, I think. But yeah, once there's noise, you're in, you're in problem. Yeah, but, yeah, but maybe yeah, we yeah, can answer this. question? If not, let's ask the speaker again. <laughs>